And Rob, you're uh, on location today, but do you have any questions when selecting a herbicide or getting getting going? Well, and, and, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen, because I do a little bit more work with the municipalities and the golf courses, is that that pond weed and algae control is being thrown in the lap due to budgets and due to the fact that whomever has some pesticide experience at the golf course or at the municipality kind of gets it into throwing in their lap. Now, the other thing that I see more and more often is they tend to not be proactive and preventative. They tend to be like, you get the call, hey, my pond is completely covered in algae. What do I do? So those are the types of questions now we're getting from more and more of our, our traditional customers because these applications are being thrown in their lap. Mm -hmm. And for budgetary purposes, they're trying to keep it in-house just to save money. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you see that more, Chris, more of a curative application um, than, than what your guys who are, you know, lake managers are going to have more of an integrated pest management program versus – Hey guys, the pond's comp completely covered with algae. What do we do? That's the question I see more and more today. Yeah, and, th and those are good. Those are good teaching opportunities. So, if if it's somebody's first time really having any kind of experience with, you know, aquatic vegetation issues, I try to take the time to you know walk them through the different, yep. you know, high level at least to educate yep. them on what we want to try to achieve, what we want to try to avoid, and while the first year of working with them may be a bit of a struggle or a learning curve to get them up to speed, yep. we can set them up. Now you know this is what this is what things look like when you let it get out of control. Sure. Um, next year in the springtime, you know, I need you to reach out to me in March, and we'll talk through a, a treatment protocol that we can do to address whatever issue it is that you had this year to keep it from becoming an issue. Um, the other thing, too, that's becoming more widely talked about, you mentioned integrated pest management, Rob. You know, when we talk about aquatic vegetation, just like terrestrial vegetation, whether it's something that we're managing for or even just a weed, you know, in managing that environment, whether it's irrigation on the terrestrial side to try to encourage growth from turf or you know, using fertilizers, all of that, like we're managing that environment. Same thing happens in aquatics. Aquatics, you know, is a different environment. However, when you talk about vegetation, you know, weeds, vascular plants, algae, all of that, the main limiting uh, nutrient for aquatic growth is phosphorus. You know, phosphorus is a big topic when we talk about runoff and, you know, fertilizer runoff and things of that in urban, urban areas. But Phosphorus is just naturally occurring. It's going to be there. It's in the hydro soil. It's con constantly re-releasing into the water column. And then when we go in and do these treatments, we're releasing all the phosphorus that's bound up within the walls of the, the cell walls of that plant or that algae. Something that is becoming more of a commonly used tool are some of these nutrient management products. So products like Phoslock, um, Utrazorb. Those are things that we can do that that especially down here in the south where we don't have, you know, ice over on lakes. Winter months, I have my guys out there, you know, where vegetation's not actively growing, but we know there's historically been a lot of issues. Uh, we can go in and mitigate some of these excessive phosphorus levels through water testing, determining a rate and a particular product that we're going to use and then get that product in the water and bind up as much of that phosphorus as we can before we get into the growing season. So by limiting the amount of phosphorus, we can reduce the likelihood, reduce the severity of an infestation of algae or weeds come spring and summer. So that's something that I think is pretty cool. That's been more of a topic over the last, I'd say five or six years, customers are seeing the benefits. Because when we go out and we treat, let's say algae, for example, that's the most basic form of, of, of aquatic growth. When we go out and treat algae, we're really just treating the symptom. The root cause is excess nutrients. So um, if we can catch the root cause, then we're going to reduce the likelihood of um, having, a, having an infestation later on down the road. All right. Well, since you brought it up, let's talk about algae. That's yeah. Good segue. So we got yeah. different types of algae. We've probably got different treatments. Mm -hmm. 
what do we need to know about Al to have a successful program and like make our pond look really nice? So there's, I'm going to talk about four different categories, three that are actually algaes, and then a fourth that gets categorized as an algae um, that's not really. So within, within the class of algae, we have planktonic algae. These are small microscopic organisms. There's thousands of different species of them. Um, it's actually the base of the food chain in aquatics. Planktonic algae, when you're in a, um, like a fishery where you're growing big fish, is the bottom of the food chain. So it takes 10 pounds. When you talk about conversion for growing fish, it takes 10 pounds of algae, these microscopic organisms, to make one pound of forage fish like bluegill or sunfish, perk, you know, these smaller bait fish. And it takes 10 pounds of those bait fish to make one pound of largemouth bass. Wow. So it's a 100-pound conversion of microscopic organisms, these planktonic algae um, cells, to create one pound of largemouth bass. So it's a pretty high conversion. So planktonic algae is something that we that we need for a, to, for a healthy fishery, but like anything, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So we wanna try to manage the, the amount of algae. So planktonic algae, if you've ever heard or seen a pond or lake turn into like pea soup, sometimes people will call it, that's typically some type of a planktonic organism. Not always an algae, though. So I talked about like a fourth um, thing that that gets lumped in with algae, and those are cyanobacterias. Cyanobacterias, like a blue-green algae, which even has algae in the common name, is actually a cyanobacteria. Cyanobacterias are problematic because not only do they, um, you know, permeate the water column, but they also produce toxins. So they can produce neurotoxins that kill fish. Uh, there's other ones called like golden out al golden algae is one that we get uh, in more saline waters uh, brackish waters I've heard a red tide like in florida that happens in salt water not in fresh water but red tide is actually a cyanobacteria that produces a toxin that kills fish harmful algal bloom is a term that you'll hear commonly um, uh, harmful algal blooms be have become more and more prevalent in you know highly urban areas where there's lots of runoff. Um, we see a lot out west as well, where um, effluent water is becoming more of a source for irrigation, just the water shortages, um, surface water shortages, under, you know, subsurface water shortages. So effluent being a tool to manage, you know, whether it's uh, turf or landscapes, when you have a holding bo water body of uh, reservoir that's holding effluent water that's extremely high in phosphorus, you're going to have a lot of vegetation issues there as well. Algae, cyanobacteria kind of get grouped together when you talk. Are they about easy to things. differentiate Differentiate between? Like, I'm sorry? Could I go out and see the difference between it or do you need like microscopes? Um, or? Yeah, sometimes I, you can tell just visibly you can tell, but when we get into a situation where I'll give an example. About two months ago, I got a call from a customer, a month and a half ago, I got a call from a customer. It's a big ranch uh, here in Texas. It's a big hunting operation. They've got a lot of high dollar exotic animals um, on this ranch. It's probably about a 10,000 acre property. They've got lakes across the whole property for fishing, but also as a water source for these um, high dollar exotic animals. Um, the ranch manager started noticing they were losing animals. They had animals dying and they were in the vicinity of some of these water holes, these ponds. Um, then he noticed that there were ish, there was some green color to the water. The water had an odor to it. Um, my customer that was a lake management company that, that had been hired to manage these, these water bodies called me, started describing the issues to me. And what I'll usually have have a customer do in that case is get a water sample and a water bottle and get it overnighted to me. And I've got facts right here next to my desk. I've got a, uh, a microscope and I'll go through and start trying to figure out what the primary um, organisms are that are prevalent in that particular water body. In this particular case, we found out that it was super high concentrations of blue green algae. So we devised a plan to get, come in and, and knock out the blue green algae that was producing a toxin. That toxin what was, is what was leading to mortality of some of these big exotic game animals. Um, yeah, we've been so able to get that under control now. And we've been using some of those nutrient management strategies I talked to earlier to prevent it from being a continual problem. 
Um, so yes, there is some lab identification that happens much like in turf or, or in ornamentals sure. where you do a pathology test to figure out what disease is there. We'll do the same thing, you know, in aquatics to identify um, the different types of algae or cyanobacteria that are present. Um, so, so that's the most basic um, form of algae is the planktonic. Then we move into what's called filamentous algae. Filamentous algae is where um, and there's lots of different species of this as well. It'll form kind of a mat over the surface. You can pick it up and hold it in your hand. It feels spongy. Um, so filamentous algae will start growing off, growing on the bottom of the pond uh, early in the season, usually a real bright green color. Um, as that algae mat develop, or becomes more mature, more dense, it'll form a mat on the bottom. And then just day-to-day -day, uh, microbial activity in the hydrosoil beneath the algae is producing CO2 and oxygen and all of that. And it'll eventually get enough air bubbles underneath that filamentous algae mat and it'll float up to the surface. That's when things really become um, not fun because uh, now you're chasing these mats around and trying to oh, treat those. Sure. Um, the way we do that is typically with a high-powered, high-pressure sprayer we do a pretty concentrated form of an algicide and break up those mats to create as much surface area as we can to absorb the algicide that we've selected. Um, the better and way to prior to that, like if you want to get out and treat it before it starts floating, mm -hmm. that's probably a lot more simple process. Maybe just going out and putting some some herbicide down. Absolutely, yeah. So when treating filaments algae, you know. Early on, um, there's some granular products that we have. So like q granular, it's a product that goes out like 60 pounds per acre. Um, method of application, steel makes uh, a really nice backpack blower that you can run granules through. And it's it makes it easy to just kind of spread that material out evenly, just like you would if you were spreading fertilizer on your lawn. You want to get even coverage. Those granules actually float down to the bottom. Um, it's a copper, a chelated copper algicide. And it'll release, the, the granules will release that copper um, off the prill and you'll have like a copper um, haze on the bottom of the pond right where that algae is growing. And that's the best way. We can get it knocked out um, pretty quickly that way. But it's Do you like, have like a time frame for that roughly? I like mean, that, how, so those, are typically, like, those are typically like early, like early in the year, early in the growing season treatments. We want to get out as early as possible whenever the algae first starts to develop on the bottom. As far as like timing on how long it takes, if it's fresh algae that's just gotten started within a few days, it's pretty much going to be smoked. It won't be active, actively grown anymore. Um, another granular product that we'll use in those cases is a product called Green Clean Pro. Green Clean Pro is actually a stabilized form of hydrogen peroxide. So it's actually a physical disturbance of the cell. Within 30 minutes of coming in contact with that chemistry, the cell walls have been destroyed. The algae actually, in fact, if you see algae on the surface that comes in contact with this peroxide chemistry, it'll start turning white um, and it's devastating almost instantly. And then there's also liquid form. So whenever we get into the state where We've got lots of algae that's occupying the entire water column or floating on the top. That's when we'll come in with like Qtrine Ultra. Qtrine Ultra is a 9% chelated copper that has a penetrating surfactant in it to help penetrate those dense mats better. Captain XTR is another example of that. Um, and then those are both, like I said, chelated coppers. And then on the peroxide side of things, we have a green clean liquid. Green Clean Liquid, not only does it have a stabilized form of peroxide, it also has paracetic acid, which is like a uh, more concentrated form of vinegar. So Green Clean Liquid and Green Clean Granule are actually OMRI listed as organic um, pesticides. They, whenever the, the only residue that they leave behind is water and oxygen when they break down. Um, those are also good oxidizers that we would call those super oxidizers. And those are really good to use in these cyanobacteria or planktonic algae treatments. Because not only are they killing the algae that's present, they're also going to help to oxidize and neutralize any um, toxin that's still there. Um, so that can, if you have a fish kill, let's say, or you have issues with surrounding animals that are consuming the water and you have sickness or death of animals, like you can come in with a green clean product treat the algae, 
knock it out, like the example that I gave you earlier. And then it's also going to neutralize the toxins that are there and making the water safe for wildlife again. Um, so kind of a dual action. And then, so we've got planktonic, we have filaminous, and then the third category is what we call macro algaes or branched algaes. Those algaes look more like uh, more like a plant, like a traditional vascular submerged plant. Um, some examples of that would be like Cara, which is spelled C-H-A-R-A, um, Nitella. Those are branched algaes. They actually have like a tendril that holds them to the bottom and they grow up from the bottom. They could be confused, like I said, with the vascular plant. However, aquatic herbicides don't work on these. Um, we have to stick with oh, that. <laughs> so that's where... So you get people that are using the wrong product because they think they're treating something, but they're really exactly. not. Yeah, just from misidentification. So kind of going back to our an earlier conversation about gathering information. Um, if you know a lot of stuff's done remote with you know the you know camera phones and stuff like that, I get pictures all day, every day from people. Hey, what's this? What's that? And um, if you had it, the worst picture that I can get from a customer is just like an overview of the lake. And it's like, okay, the lake looks bad, <laughs> but I need to know what's growing on the water. So I always ask people, go ahead and harvest some, some out of the water. Don't send me a picture of a big clump. Send me some individual stems of whatever you see. And if there's four or five different things that are growing, separate those out individually. Get a good light, um, you know, a light background, like whether it's a boat dock or white tailgate on a truck or a concrete boat ramp, take some good up close pictures of those, send them to me, and then I can properly identify what we're dealing with uh, and then get a plan put together from there. So, yeah, but they really are all the same. It's just plant aquatic. So you're dealing with golf course superintendent or a lawn care company. They snap a photo of a yard that's got some bare spots. What's the problem? And it's like, well, exactly. Give me some more information about what we're looking at here. So that's the same exact thing that it's just an industry issue, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got to get more granular and, and uh, figure out everything that's going on. There's lots of questions to ask before we even put the first drop of product in the water. So we have planktonic filaminous and branched algaes. And then, like I said, within the planktonic category, we also have cyanobacteria. So that's algae. Rob, did you have something? You came off a of mute there. Yep, yep. I had a question. Chris, is it the uh, cyanobacteria that we're experiencing that are causing these... Uh, uh, beach closures and, and pet warnings here in, in Colorado. Is that what we're dealing with there? We've had a number yeah. of those as we went from very cold and wet, and then all of a sudden we jumped to 95, and there was blooms and all of our, you know, common, you know, and favorite swimming areas, and a lot of mm -hmm. them were closed around the 4th of July because of the, the – and that's what I thought it was, was the cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's probably – some type of blue green algae is most likely what's happening. I don't know the specific lake that you're referring to or lakes, but more often than not, it's it's a blue green algae issue. Um, and yeah, yeah it, it can be to the point where those toxins can be um, detrimental or even deadly to humans. So that's why they will shut down lakes like that because just coming in contact with it or accidentally ingesting some of the lake water um, can yep. lead to some pretty severe issues. Um, like I yep. said, some of those toxins are, are neurotoxins. So um, okay. you could have some major issues go on, um, long-term lasting chronic issues, not just like acute sickness. And uh, just as an experience with Chris, um, I did have a, a, a sago pondweed issue in an irrigation ditch over by Rifle, Colorado. And I did exactly what Chris described we went and harvested some, put it on a white background, and took photos and sent them to Chris. And he put together a, a program for us with a, a product called Cascade and basically showed us how to control the Sago Pondweed issue that had been an issue for years for this uh, ditch district in uh, the rifle area. So the, yeah. the system does work. Yeah, and that's a good that's a good point to bring up too, because you know we're not always dealing with just quiescent static water bodies, ponds and lakes. There's also times where we deal with you know canals or these irrigation ditches that Rob talked about, and having water flow adds another level of complexity to treating um, vegetation. So 
in that particular case, when you're trying to push a slug of water to get to users or, you know, whether it's municipalities for drinking water or irrigation for crops or um, whatever the water is being used for, when you, when the, when that submerged vegetation starts to occupy the water column, it now becomes like a, a plug um, in that yep. system where you're not able to flow the amount of water downstream that you need to flow. In fact, a lot of times it'll start overflowing the levees that contain that canal and they're not able to get the water down to their users. And so um, that is probably, I don't know, about a dozen years ago or so, uh, started doing some new work where we actually have a device that we developed to inject a herbicide into the flowing water. And then we have like a slug of treated water that now moves down the system with the water flow and will expose that vegetation to a lethal dosage of whatever herbicide we selected for a period of maybe 12 hours, if that's how long we set up this drip treatment for, and it'll wipe out that vegetation as the water moves along through the um, through the treatment area. So we've had situations based on, you know, depending on the flow, how fast the water's moving and, and all of that, but you could set up a treatment point at the top end of one of these canals and, and have control over 10, 15, 20, 80 miles of canal system could be treated from one one injection point um that was what, what one of the that was what rob was kind of talking about over there in colorado that they uh had some good success with sounds like something maybe the professionals would handle with yeah well, what's that right actually we did it with a we did it with the ditch organization and chris walked us through the process they built mm -hmm. us the apparatus in houston and sent it out to us we followed his procedures and protocol and it was actually the ditch rider is what they call these guys that go up and down these large irrigation ditches. And the one that we were doing in rifle was, uh, it was 18 miles long. We were up almost at the head gate. And the, uh, the interesting thing about it was it was so effective that after, I want to say three years of treatments, we had no issues anymore. It had completely eradicated the sago pondweed from the irrigation ditch. Nice. That's good to hear. I like that. Moving on to our next topic. We talked about algae. Let's talk about some submerged vegetation, different types that you might see, and then what are some treatment options we got? Yeah. So, you know, submerged vegetation, uh, like the name implies, is anything that's growing underwater. Um, these are plants, some of the common ones you'll hear like milfoil, hydrilla, coontail, naiad. I mean, there's there's tons of different ones, but those are some of the big, the big offenders. When we talk about submerged vegetation, much like treating algae, we want to try to get ahead of it as quickly as possible. There are different types of products. Some are contact, some are systemic. Contact herbicides give us some flexibility where we can go in and do spot treatments, just treat one section of the lake. Systemic herbicides um, require longer exposure time to the herbicide and we typically are going to treat the entire water body with the systemic product. <clears throat> so I'll give an example. We'll just say we have a one acre pond that's got southern naiad or bushy pond weeds, another common name for that particular plant, and we want to go in and treat it. So we could go in with a contact herbicide and, and get quick control, um, you know, get it knocked back or we could use a systemic. A systemic product, an example of that would be like Sonar. If uh, it's a product that's manufactured by Cpro, it comes in various different forms or formulations, some liquid, some granular. Um, based on the type of vegetation that we have growing, we know that certain levels of this fluoridone, which is the active ingredient in Sonar, have to be present in the water for a period of 30 to 45 days, depending on the plant, in order to have full control. So to one of the questions earlier was like, well, how long does it take for the product to work? In this case, a systemic treatment with sonar would take at minimum a month. Now, leading up to that, you know, during that 30 day window, you will start to see some of the symptomology from the herbicide. Sonar or fluoridone, the active ingredient, is a carotene inhibitor, which carotene is a building block of chlorophyll. So essentially what we're doing is eliminating the plant's ability to create chlorophyll. 
Um, so that's going to cause bleaching. Whenever we get about a week or so into the treatment and you pull some of that, pro that plant material out of the water, you'll start to see the growing points of the plant turn colors. Sometimes it'll be Interestingly enough, it's like a hot pink color, and then from hot pink, it'll turn white, and then from white, it'll turn brown. Once it gets to the brown stage, that's when we know that the plant's um, on its way out. Once the plant dies, it does take longer for stuff that's in the water to decompose, and it does, you know, if we spray weeds on, on dry land. Uh, now we have to wait for that to decompose. The benefit, though, of a systemic treatment like that is not only are we controlling what's there at the time. But as new things try to, to germinate, new plants try to germinate during that treatment window, um, it's gonna knock those out as they come in contact with that particular compound that's in the water. Yeah, so you're um, staying ahead of it. You're staying ahead of it, yeah. And so that's some of those early season treatments that we can do before the plants even become a problem. You can go out with a rake and drag the bottom. And when you start to see uh, new plants germinating, then that's, the time that we recommend that you go out with the with the with the herbicide treatment. Examples of products that we use for treating submerged vegetation. I talked about sonar. Um, Aquathol is a is a great tool. Aquathol is um, good because it doesn't require long periods of contact. With Aquathol, you know we're looking for anywhere from like 48 to 72 hours of contact time to get adequate control. That's good in a situation where uh, one of the questions that I'll always ask about a particular water body is um, the dynamics of that system. So what's the watershed like? If we get a big rainfall, is there a complete exchange of water? Does all the water get flushed out? Because if we go and do a systemic treatment today and next week we get a massive rain event and it flushes all the water out, now we're starting over from ground zero. We just lost all that product that we put in the water. With a contact type herbicide, we can go in and do a treatment today. It could rain all at once tomorrow because the, the herbicide's already been taken up by the plant. The contact time required's already happened um, and we can move on down the road. Chris, question for you. Um, if, these, if these ponds are using some of these systemic herbicides are also irrigation water, say they're, mm -hmm. they're either watering sports fields, golf course, parks, whatever, are there precautions mm -hmm. that the customer needs to take when they're doing that? And is there a timing that they can't use that irrigation water? I know this is a question I get all the time. They, they, yeah. they worry about the herbicides being contaminated, a contaminant in their irrigation water. And are they going to ruin their, 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 their golf course or their sports fields with their irrigation water because they use the systemic herbicide? Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely a concern. Um, in fact, if I know, if I know a water body is being used for irrigation, I'll steer away from these systemic products for a couple of reasons. One, labeling, you know, okay. limits or reduces our, restricts us from using that in an irrigation pond. Um, okay. Second thing is typically if we're irrigating from a water body, not only are we pulling water out to irrigate, but we're also adding water in. So there's water exchange that takes place. Um, and if we're sucking water sure. out, we're now diluting that concentration level. So that's a problem as well. Uh, now with like Sonar, for example, I'll use that because that's a really common, com everybody knows that brand name and uh, it's commonly used. There is a section on that label that if you can go through and do testing on the water and, and show that the concentration level of fluoridone is less than 10 parts per billion, I did say that right, 10 ppb okay. parts per billion, then that water can be used for irrigation purposes at that, that's the threshold. So as far as testing goes, you know, CPRO that manufactures that product, they offer testing. So we work with them in order to get water tested if we need to. And that tool can be used for not only that case to verify that the water's safe to use for irrigation, but also to ensure that we have the right concentration in the water to control the vegetation in question. When we go to, like I talked about earlier with like bathymetric studies and water volume studies on lakes and ponds, we're not always precise. We can take a best guesstimate sometimes and, and use that when we're devising a rate or amount of product that needs to be applied. But we can double check that by pulling a water sample and have it tested to see what the concentration level is.
and then we'll know if we need to add more if we're already at the appropriate dosage. Since we brought up irrigation, I have a question. Mm -hmm. If you've got an irrigation pond that's got a huge algae issue, are you also going to have algae problems on your turf, like your greens and teas, if the water is pulling algae from the pond? That's a good question. I was the the kind of algae that you see like on like if you had like back when I was a golf course superintendent, sometimes you would get little bare areas, maybe where um, drainage wasn't as good, so the soil stayed a little more saturated, especially in the summertime when you're watering a lot, and you get a develop a bare area, then you would get sometimes a coat or a little um, bit of algae growth on the surface of the soil that impeded the growth of the, the grass. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, that's a good question. I don't know that there's a connection between algae in your pond and algae growing on like a putting surface. Uh, I think that's more just an environmental limiting factor when you have a moist or wet area, just like a boat ramp. If you ever gotten out of a boat ramp and you see algae growing on the on the concrete and it's slippery, I mean, it's a similar type of thing that's going to happen on a on a putting green that's staying wet. So. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry for the tangent. No, Rob, no. did you have any <laughs> other thoughts or questions on the submerged vegetation? Yeah, yeah. One, one, more, one more quick one on the algae. Um, Chris, I, I've got a lot of customers that I've been working with that, um, especially around the metro area, they've been getting switched to non-potable water. So there's been this huge push where we've ran piping all over Denver. We're now moving non-potable water. And in a lot of cases, it's being moved from the city non-potable source to an irrigation pond that used to be another water source. Now it's non-potable. And they're starting to see more and more algae issues with that with that non-potable water. Is that because of the additional nutrients that we're getting along with that non-potable water that we just have a more favorable situation for an algae growth because of the, because I mean, non-potable water has all, I mean, depending on the source, it has all kinds or other nutrients that are just you know extra parts to the water column yeah absolutely in fact uh th just this week on monday um i was working with a customer of mine that's carrying a lake management company that's carrying for some lakes on a uh, lakes and ponds on a golf course on the south side of houston here and uh they've had a lot of algae issues and it's just been a repetitive cycle where they go in they treat algae they come back, they got to treat it again. It just keeps coming back. They are using non-potable effluent water to irrigate this particular golf course. Yep. Um, so I had them pull water samples a couple weeks ago from the pond itself that they're using for irrigation. And then also directly from the source that's filling that pond, um, which is the effluent source. So what we would consider okay. like an acceptable, um, uh, concentration of phosphorus in a pond is around 0.01 to 0.015 ppm of total phosphorus. That's like kind of our goal. That's okay. enough to support some algae growth that's needed for the health of the pond, but not enough to have where we have like an abundance. This particular um, pond was at 1.76. So let me do, get, do my math here. So 0 0.015, uh, let's see, 1.76 divided by 0 0.015. So we were at like 120x of what would be deemed acceptable oh. amount of phosphorus in that particular pond because they're using effluent water. Um, so yep. here's the other challenge that's posed in that situation. You could go in and use one of those nutrient management tools I talked about earlier, like Phoslock or Nutrisorb, and that's going to bind up any phosphorus that's in the water at that time. But in this case, this golf course superintendent is irrigating the golf course nightly, and after about three or four days, they've taken all the water and replaced all that water with new water. So by doing a water column treatment for managing phosphorus, we haven't really, we haven't really achieved anything. So what we're working on right now is coming up with an idea uh, or coming up with a, a plan to treat the water as it's coming out of the pipe from the effluent water source as it's going into the pond so we can reduce the amount of phosphorus before it gets in the pond. Um, so that's actually something I'm working on right now. 
Um, and that way, you know, we can reduce the amount of headaches because not only do you have all this allergy, it looks, it looks bad on the golf course, but also it's clogging up screens on their pump station. I mean, it's just yep. leads to lots of issues that you don't want to have in the middle of summertime when you're trying to keep a golf course alive. So I had a great comment, but I was on mute. I was saying it's like a Brita, but for- a Brita. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In fact, there's a, um, so there's a product <laughs> called these, these Utrazorb filter socks is one of the things that we're looking at as a possible tool where you can lay these filter bags down in the water flow. And as the water flows through that filtration pack, it's it's pulling and stripping some of the nutrients out of the water uh, column before it gets a chance to make it downstream into the pond or wherever it's going. So cool. yeah, you'll have to keep me you'll have to keep me um, you know updated on what you find because essentially what you just de- described is exactly what my customer is dealing with. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, the golf course is only water source is the effluent water from the uh, from the uh, Big Sky ski area. That's all they have for a source. Okay. So, um, that's and and it comes in it comes in waves like as this irrigation water goes down they refill the pond and they bring a bunch over from where they're storing the effluent water at the at the ski the ski hill facility. So he gets these slugs of new effluent water. And then he gets a bloom and Mm -hmm. this bloom is occurring in an area that, you know, nighttime temperatures are in the fifties, but he still gets a bloom every time he gets a new water load Mm -hmm. from the, uh, from the effluent water. So if you find us anything, definitely let me know. Cause that is a, that is a real world problem now because of how many people are starting to utilize effluent water, especially in municipal and, and, you know, government type resort situations. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's another, another tool. Um, so wastewater, that, that's some overlap in the wastewater treatment world. So wastewater treatment world, they use some of the same products that we use for cleaning up the water. Um, they also have other tools that they use, but something that's become a growing um, part of the industry is using biological or microbial based products. So by so I'll use one that we promote that we have had great results with um, here at Heritage is a product made by BioSafe Systems, the same people that make Green Clean. Uh, the mm-hmm. other side we talked about earlier, they have a product called Green Clean Green Clean Pond Block, and it's a block that you it comes in like a little a little mesh bag. Um, you would tie it off to like a boat dock or or float it off of a buoy. Um, one block is enough to treat about an acre and it takes about a month for that block to to dissolve in the water column and as it dissolves it's introducing bacteria and enzymes that are used to reduce nutrients in the water column uh-huh. and also to break down muck and um you know detritus that builds up on the bottom of the pond just naturally so those are a really yep. good tool for people to use for like a maintenance type uh not like hit the reset button on the amount of phosphorus that's in the water column, but maybe after you get things under control, this is a good tool to employ to help ma- maintain that healthy water environment. Chris, to rank the different issues that you would see on in a body of water, like we got algae, submerged vegetation, and next would be the emerge or floating vegetation. Mm-hmm. Like where, where do you rank all those as far as aesthetics for the lake or the pond. I mean, they can all be be equally problematic. Just depends on the, depends on the setting. Um, You know, with emergent vegetation, you know, typically that's going to be limited just to the shoreline or that, that littoral zone that we call it just the, maybe if there's like planting shelves or shallow water just around the perimeter, we don't see a lot of that growing out in the middle of the lake. So, um it's limited to the water depth so within that emergent and floating plant category we have stuff like cattails uh any kind of water lily um floating plants like duckweed or water meal um there's a lot of invasive plants that fall in that category water hyacinth common salvinia giant salvinia Uh, then we have creeping varieties like alligator weed water primrose water willow 
um, Phragmites. There's a lot of different types of plants and they all respond differently to different herbicides. And so when we come up with a treatment plan for those emergent forms of vegetation, there may be six or seven, 10 different species that are all growing together. And we've got to make sure that our tank mix that we devise, just like you would in turf, um, typically it's not just one problem. We've got multiple weeds. We, we use different products in a tank mix to make sure that we can control all of those with one, one treatment. So you're not going to come back multiple times with mo multiple applications. At uh, what point is somebody going to be like, we have to start controlling these emerged weeds? Well, typically when it um, impedes the usability of the lake, you know, if it's something where this pond or lake is used for fishing purposes and people are fishing from the shoreline and there's a band of vegetation growing around the perimeter, it makes it difficult to cast and reel in fish. So um, usually that that's when we'll get a call. And then also like, you know, golf course or HOA, you know, home, you know, neighborhood community lakes and ponds. Usually they like for those to be clean and free of any vegetation visible. They want it to be clean, open water, and then butt it up to whatever the grass, you know, the landscape grasses are and have it clean. But we get out onto, you know, lakes that are out on a ranch where they're managing that fishery for big fish. Having some habitat is is critical to that. So Fishing all the little for lakes, sure. they need places to hide. Otherwise, they're just going to get consumed by the predator fish. And it's not a sustainable um, fishery in that instance. So having structure and habitat to an extent is important. Now we don't want the whole lake to be taken over. This is where treating sections and devising a plan for that particular water body. So goals and expectations vary based on what the water is used for, what the customer wants to see. I mean, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. One, a fisherman could go out and look at a lake that's covered in vegetation. And that could be like Christmas morning for him because he knows that there's gonna be a lot of a lot of fish in there. Um, and it's easier to locate the fish when you're fishing along the edge of vegetation. Um, but if it was something that was managed for like a community, they could come out and it would be ugly and you know the worst thing they've ever seen because they don't wanna have any vegetation or weeds growing in those lakes. Um, so it might be a little bit more apparent than the submerged vegetation. Obviously, you can't see it when you just glance at the lake and see right. with the algae. This is going to be a big eyesore for people that are looking for it. Correct. Yeah. And then with the submerged vegetation and algae, usually when it gets to the point that you can visibly see it on the pond or the lake, you got big problems because it's yeah. grown up through the entire water column. Now you have a four, five, six, seven foot tall plant that's under the water that we've got to get under control. And um, once it gets to that point, it, it's a long road to get back to where we were before, you know, with a clean open water body. So let's go back and just kind of um, revisit the devising a plan, you know, protocol and, and how would you set up, maybe not for each individual, but just like, what are the steps just kind of go back through that. Yeah. So devising a plan. So first is, you know, identify the different plants that are there. Make sure we have a good ID on those. Um, figure out what the water is used for, what the goals are of the customer. If they want it to be free of any vegetation, if they want to have some. Um, the dynamics of that water body, like when we do get a big rain event, what's the watershed like? Do we get a total exchange or is it only catching surface water? Um, and then, you know, looking at just the time of the year, what water temperatures, things of that nature. And with all that information, then we can come up with a, with a plan. Okay, we're going to treat this area first. We're going to use this particular product. You know, and it's not a one and done deal either. You know, it could be where you're just doing multiple treatments throughout the year just to maintain whatever the acceptable level of vegetation is for that particular water body. So it's a, it's an ongoing deal. Um, and year over year too, like you're not going to get hundred percent control where you never have to go back and make a treatment. Like exactly, you might yeah, get yeah. maybe a year where you get back up to that threshold where you need to control it again, but 
best to just maintain and preventatively mm-hmm. treat if you know that there's an issue there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other thing too, like ponds and lakes, they, it's funny cause they'll, they'll kind of develop their own personality. I mean, you could be on a golf course or on a ranch or in a, in a neighborhood and have multiple lakes on that same property. And each lake may have a different issue than the others. And so over time, as you, you know, employ these control measures, you'll start to learn, okay, well, on this particular lake, like we know this works well for early spring treatment. Um, we did it last year. And you, as time goes on, you gain more knowledge and, and experience on managing the particular lakes. So notes and pictures, notes and pictures are very helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely.